Welcome to our project. Please pay close attention as we go through important aspects and requirements. First and foremost, please watch the following video to help us prevent the spread of COVID-19. As we continue to navigate through this pandemic, I want you to know that we are doing everything we can to ensure your safety so that we can continue to build critical infrastructure for our clients and communities. I wanna thank you for everything that you're doing to help keep our job sites and offices safe places to work. To help stop the spread of COVID-19, please follow these protocols. Before coming to work, it is recommended to check your temperature and assess how you feel. All individuals will also be screened upon arrival to the job site. You should stay home if you have a fever greater than 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit, a persistent cough, an acute or a new respiratory illness causing shortness of breath, or if you've been in close contact with someone who has these symptoms. If you meet any of these conditions, or if you feel sick during your shift, please stop work and contact your supervisor as soon as possible. On the job site, as in public, it's important to practice social distancing. That means keeping a distance of six feet minimum at all times, whenever possible. This goes especially for meetings. If you hold an in-person meeting, meet outside or in a well-ventilated area if possible. Limit your number to 10 people or less. Face coverings are recommended. Include only essential attendees. Space at least six feet between each person and don't share communal food. Boxed lunches are okay. For common areas, such as lunch and break spaces and restrooms and hand washing stations, maintain proper spacing. If a common area does not allow for proper spacing, consider taking turns or staggering times for use. Limit other scenarios that conflict with social distancing. Avoid physical contact. Refer to the vehicle guidance document for shared vehicle recommendations. In accordance with CDC guidelines, we're requiring employees to keep face masks on their person and to wear face masks when working within six feet of each other. It is also essential to wash your hands thoroughly for at least 20 seconds after using the bathroom, before and after preparing or eating food, after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing, or after touching any kind of contaminated surface or object. If you're unable to wash your hands, use hand sanitizer as an alternative. If you sneeze or cough, use a tissue or your elbow. Do your best to avoid touching your face. As it applies to your role and workplace, clean and disinfect high-touch surfaces that means kitchen and coffee water areas, restrooms, break rooms and lunch rooms, doorknobs and handles, stair rails and other railings, shared hand tools and power tools, or other equipment such as generators, pressure washers, or oxyacetylene. Other areas include vehicle cabs, door handles, radio knobs, etc., including pool cars, wash stations, phones, and keyboards. If someone at your office or project is believed to have been exposed to COVID-19, that location must follow a special deep cleaning or viral contamination cleanup process. Contact the project manager immediately about potential exposure. Well, that's a lot of things to remember. If you have questions related to Sun's COVID-19 response plan or company protocol, talk to your supervisor or project leadership, or visit the website on the screen. For urgent matters related to COVID-19, please contact your manager. Call the Sunt COVID-19 hotline at 480-293-3255 or email crisis at sunt.com. Please be sure to follow these protocols. These are very unusual circumstances we're working under. We need everyone to do their part to help maintain a clean and safe workplace. 
Thank you for your efforts and thank you for everything that you do. Sticky is what we refer to as that can kill you. We focus on preventing it when planning and executing our work. We share ideas for preventing sticky during THA meetings. And we focus on the fatal eight. that's built at heights. that's built underground. that moves. that lifts. that shocks. that's hazardous. that pinches or crushes. that has stored energy. Remember, speak up, listen up for Sticky. One of the unique things about Sunt is our commitment to relentless housekeeping. Our sites are impeccable compared to others in the industry, and we're very proud of it. Everyone is expected to play a part in maintaining relentless housekeeping on our projects. At all times, we have some basic requirements. Floors must remain in a broom-swept condition. Egress pathways must be clear of metal and debris. Material needs to be stored on rolling pallets or carts as much as possible. Used water bottles and cups must be properly disposed. Waste must be immediately placed into containers. No food or beverages other than water are allowed in work areas. We must leave the site at the end of each day in great shape. Cords and hoses need to be rolled up and stored. Tools need to be stored in gang boxes. Work areas need to be broom swept. As an important note, when broom sweeping, do not create dust clouds. Instead, use clean sweep, wet methods, careful practices, etc. Thank you for executing relentless housekeeping with Sun. Here are some additional hazards and requirements to be aware of. In the event of a severe or life-threatening injury, call the site emergency phone number or 911. Then notify the Sun superintendent immediately. If an evacuation is signaled, stop working immediately, drop and leave your tools behind, proceed to the designated meeting area, form into a group with your coworkers, remain quiet and listen for instructions, report to your supervisor for a head count. Do not return to your work area or leave the job site for any reason until instructed. Immediately notify your supervisor and the Sun superintendent of any accident or injury requiring on-site treatment. Note, we have a first aid kit located in the job trailer. Of any near miss, of any damage to equipment or property, whether company or public, including all fires. Injury requiring medical attention or transportation to a hospital or minor emergency clinic. We have options to ensure injuries are given the best treatment available. Again, it is critical to notify a Sunt superintendent right away if you have an injury that needs first aid or medical treatment. Consuming or being under the influence will result in immediate removal from site. Post-accident or incident drug testing is mandatory. No smoking or tobacco will be allowed on site. No staring or rude gestures. No swearing. No offensive clothing or images. Always be professional. Visitors are tour groups, union representatives, vendor representatives, suppliers, rental companies, and more. Visitors must have justifiable business on the job site. They must report to the Sunt office to sign in and take the visitor orientation. Know that every Sunt project has a safety recognition program in place that may consist of raffle drawings for positive acts and observations, barbecues for safe crews, family boards, family buttons and photos, and more. Participate with us as we value safety by choice. All sun projects require hard hat, safety glasses, high visibility clothing or vest, and sturdy work boots as a minimum level of personal protective equipment for everyone on site. Additional task specific PPE may be required by your task and will be addressed in the task hazard analysis. Delivery drivers and all visitors to the site must also comply with these PPE requirements. Sunt All Hand Safety Meeting is held weekly 
at a time and a place that the project team will give you. All are required to attend and all should participate. In addition to the SUNT-led safety meeting, each contractor on site is required to hold a safety meeting with their crew to go over the hazards associated with their activities. The progressive discipline policy on a SUNT project is simple. Know the rules and abide by them. The purpose of this orientation is to familiarize you with the rules of the project. It's up to you to ask questions if you need clarification. This orientation is considered the first notification in a progressive discipline policy. If you are found in violation of any safety rule, you may receive a written warning if it's not of a nature that would endanger your life or present an immediate threat to yourself or someone else. Any serious safety violation will result in immediate removal from this project. A subsequent safety violation or one that is serious in nature will result in your removal from this project. If your work area presents potential hazards to others working around you, ensure that you have proper barriers, warning signs, and or spotters to warn others. Chemicals and products used in your task can present a hazard. A daily review of the safety data sheets and THA associated with your task will help you to identify these hazards and plan accordingly. Make sure you're prepared to handle a chemical spill and should one occur, notify SUNT immediately. All work on energized equipment, vehicles or tools must follow established lockout tagout procedures. This applies to all stored energy, including gravity, compressed air, gases, and spring tension to name a few. Fuel must be transported and stored in the appropriate containers like the ones shown. The use of plastic or any other non-approved container is not allowed on this project. Fire extinguishers must be within 20 feet of hot work being performed or mounted within 20 feet of any petroleum powered equipment or tool. Fire extinguishers must have documented monthly inspections on the tag, not be expired and in good working condition. A hot work permit is required for all heat, spark or flame generating activities. Designate a fire watch to monitor hot work activity during and up to 30 minutes after the task is complete. Keep oxygen and acetylene tanks separated by an approved firewall or 25 feet and stored securely during transportation and storage. Falls continue to be the leading cause of death and serious injury in our industry. Working at heights is shit that can kill you. We must prevent people, tools, material, and equipment from falling by properly planning and executing our work. The first step is to eliminate the need to work at heights, perhaps by prefabbing on the ground or in a controlled environment. Next, we need to consider engineering controls like tall parapets or guardrail systems. If that doesn't prevent the exposure, we then look to administrative controls such as establishing a controlled access zone with signage. Our last resort for stopping the drop is PPE such as a harness, lanyard, and anchor point, or perhaps a tool tether to prevent dropped objects. It's important to identify all fall exposures daily with the use of the THA and to write a fall protection plan specific to your task. Any work performed at a height of 6 feet or higher or use of a boom lift requires 100% tie off 100% of the time. Mid rail chain is required in all scissor lifts. Follow the manufacturer's instructions or other requirements for fall protection. A competent person must plan for the appropriate anchorage systems and personal fall arrest systems and these should be inspected prior to each use. All floor holes, deck penetrations, manholes, and roof openings greater than 2 inches must be covered and marked as opening, do not remove. Covers must be secured from movement and maintained by the trade that created the hazard. Maintain guardrails in safe condition. Do not remove without permission from sunt supervision. If a guardrail is broken, unsecured, or damaged, Notify the supervisor or SUNT supervision immediately or correct it if safe to do so. Danger flagging is only to be used for danger to life or limb. Signs must be attached stating the reason for the flagging and a number to call for entry. Only authorized employees completing the work can be inside the danger flagging. No other employees are allowed to cross the danger tape 
without permission. Caution flagging can be used and crossed by other employees when a hazard can be seen and avoided. Signs must be attached stating the reason for the flagging and the number to call for information. Flagging for use as a controlled access zone must be installed a minimum of six feet back from the fall hazard. In order for safety barricades and danger or caution flagging to be used correctly, it must be installed correctly, maintained, and immediately removed when the hazard no longer exists. Ladders can be useful tools when used for their intended purpose. When used incorrectly, they are the leading cause of falls and serious injuries. When writing your THA, always ask, is the ladder the best tool for this job? Can I do my work safely from a ladder? How will I get materials and tools up and down? Make sure the ladder is inspected for damaged or missing components and that all of the manufacturer's labels are in readable condition. Make sure that you set up and use the ladder per the manufacturer's instructions and that it is secured. Never stand on the top or the next rung down on a step ladder. Scaffold must be inspected before each use by each trade using the scaffold. Inspections must be documented and turned into SUNT. Scaffold required proper tagging to inform employees that a scaffold is safe or unsafe to use. Red tag means stop. Green tag means go. All employees must be properly trained before using scaffold. Training documentation must be available. Prior to digging any excavation or trench, an excavation plan must be submitted to Sunt Supervision, detailing the length and depth of the trench, any unique considerations or encumbrances, and the sloping, benching, or shoring or other methods that will be used to protect workers while in the excavation. Excavation inspections must be performed daily before allowing employees to enter a trench and when weather or other outside factors affect the safety of employees inside the trench. Ladders or ramps or other means of safe access are required in all trenches and excavations. Ladders must be secured from movement. Safe access must be provided for crossing over excavations. Design will vary based on the depth or width of the excavation. Planking and bridging are typically acceptable methods. Electricity is everywhere on our projects, and so are the hazards associated with it. Ground Fault Circuit Interruption Protection, or GFCI, is required on all outlets, including generators and house power. All generators must be grounded. Ensure that Adequate lighting is present to perform the task. Headlamps might work well for what's in front of you, but well, what about moving around the area that you're working in? Take the necessary actions to protect the extension cords from damage, from traffic, equipment, and people. Never run over a cord with a piece of equipment, and be careful of sharp edges that may damage the insulation. Any extension cord found to be defective such as ground missing or the insulation cut, will be removed from service and physically tagged out of service. Roll up all electric cords daily and inspect for damage as you do so. Only power cords used for charging equipment will be left out overnight. Those cords will be neatly rolled up next to the equipment that they're charging. Confined space operations will be identified in the THA. Make sure that the proper permits have been applied for and approved before beginning any work and that air monitoring or ventilation have been addressed. Ensure that employees entering a confined space have been properly trained and that everyone involved has been trained and is knowledgeable of the rescue plan. It is important to conduct a workplace inspection prior to the start of every shift. Constantly monitor the THA and notify all personnel of any changes to the conditions of the workplace and any potential hazard that may have arisen as the result of this change. You should perform a 360 degree walk around inspection of each piece of equipment before use. Things can change in even a few minutes. 
Only designated personnel are allowed to operate equipment. Operators' names must be submitted to the Sunt project supervision and approved prior to them operating equipment. Then complete the proper inspection forms for the equipment being used and submit a copy to Sunt daily. Ensure that all parts of the equipment are functioning properly before using the equipment, such as lights, horns, and backup alarms. All equipment or vehicles incorporating a gas or diesel engine must have a fire extinguisher mounted on board or within the working area. Wear seat belts at all times and obey the job site speed limits. Here are some additional project specific do's and don'ts that are important for you to know. Report any unsafe or unsanitary condition immediately to your supervisor or to a sun supervisor. No children or animals will be allowed on site. Do not come to work ill or fatigued. There is no dry cutting allowed of cement containing products. Any dust generating activity such as sweeping, chipping, grinding must use engineering controls such as HEPA vacuums or wet methods to contain the dust. All grinding operations require goggles or spoggles in addition to a face shield. No loose or frayed clothing, sweatpants, shorts, or badly worn shoes. Shirts must have sleeves. A third party crane inspection is required on all cranes used on this project. Only non-conductive ladders will be allowed on this site and all ladders must be used per manufacturer's instructions. Anyone improperly using portable restrooms or writing graffiti anywhere on the job site will be removed from the site. Know where fire extinguishers and first aid kits are located. Know your company's heat illness prevention plan and practice it. Planning for safety is critical. Please watch this video that explains our mandatory safety planning requirements. This task hazard analysis shall be used at the beginning of each shift and prior to each new task. Every foreman shall meet with all crew members of their crew to identify, evaluate, and discuss each new task they will be performing during the shift. Remember to keep the discussion moving, serious, and to the point. Having others in the group lead the discussion helps keep the subject matter fresh and adds more than one point of view. In order to properly visualize the task and hazards in the area of your work, the THA is best done at the place where the task is to be performed. The project manager, superintendent, foreman, and safety personnel can help you write a good THA. The project staff will also periodically review the task hazard analysis forms to ensure that they're being done correctly. They will be looking for a quality THA that is relevant to the task to be performed. Now the following examples are from a concrete form setting operation. The first thing to do is break the task into steps. We can break the task of wall forming into the following tasks. Material handling, flying forms, setting forms, and accessing forms. Now, you should be able to, with the help of your crew, better identify the hazards associated with these steps. It's important to be in the work area to see any specific hazards that are unique to the area and it may make you think of some things that you wouldn't have if you had done this in the trailer. Here are some things to ask when considering potential hazards. Is special training needed, for example, forklift or powder actuated tool? Are permits required, such as hot work permits or confined space permits? Will there be exposure to dusts, fumes, or other hazardous materials? You will need to review the safety data sheet for these products with your crew. Is the employee working with sharp or rough materials that require PPE? Can any body part get caught in, struck by, or caught between objects? Can pushing, pulling, lifting, bending, or twisting cause a strain? Do tools, machines, or equipment present a hazard? Can the worker slip, trip, or fall? Are there flammables or electrical hazards? Can the employee fall from one level to another or on the same level? Is noise or vibration a problem? Is there danger from falling objects? Is the work area cluttered? Is cleanup needed? Is lighting a problem? Can weather conditions affect safety? 
Following are a few ways to identify safe work procedures. Eliminate the hazard. For example, put handrail on the form while it's on the ground instead of after it's erected. Find a safer way to do the job. Use equipment to move material instead of carrying it by hand. Reducing or eliminating the hazard is preferred over PPE, but as a final protection measure, wear the appropriate PPE. As you can see, there are many items to be addressed that, when broken down into their simplest terms, are easier to identify. The following day, we're performing the same task and have it broken down into many of the same steps. We have added a few other hazards that were identified, eye injury, slips, trips, and falls, and losing control of a load. Since we have new hazards identified, we've added some new safe work procedures. Something as simple as make sure everyone has the proper safety glasses and work gloves for the task needs to be addressed, as well as several items added about one particular subject, overhead loads, securing loose materials on the forms, using taglines, inspecting rigging, and staying clear of the load are some important things to discuss. We also mentioned the 100% tie-off policy. We should also ask employees if they've ever experienced any problems in the past when performing this task and what lessons they've learned. Make sure you capture these examples and that everyone understands what was done wrong and what we should be doing to do it correctly. We are all here to look after each other. Please watch the following videos on speaking and listening up. There are as many different personality types in the workplace as there are people. But even though there are differences that divide us, there's one thing that we all have in common. The anxiety we feel about speaking up when we see another person working in a way that isn't safe. No one wants to see anybody get hurt. But it happens all too often when folks don't speak up. We see someone doing something that isn't safe. They could get hurt or hurt someone else. And what do we do? Nothing. Oh, it's not that we don't care. No, of course we care. And we want to speak up and warn the other person that what they're doing just isn't safe. But we make excuses. He must know what he's doing. Ah, someone else will tell him. Well, it's not my place to say something. But you know what? It is your place. It doesn't matter who the other person is or whether you even know them. Each of us has both a right and the responsibility to give constructive feedback to anyone who's working in a way that isn't safe. That's what we call speaking up. So what's getting in our way? Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think it's because we all have this natural fear of confrontation. Bottom line, we never know how someone else will react to our feedback. Bell, we got a big debris pile. We need move by the end of the day. We got to get trucks rolling in here right away. I got it. I'll get that done by this afternoon. Suppose two of you just finished a conversation and you're ready to get back to work. But he has taken a call and is now unaware of what's going on around him. You want to tell him to clear the area so you can go back to work. But if you do, how will he take it? Will he resent you for bringing it up? Is it worth taking the risk? After all, he is your boss. Let's face it, when we step up to give someone else feedback, it can feel like we're taking a risk. I mean, we might set the other person off, right? They might not want to hear our feedback. They might even get angry at us. Well, okay, but here's the good news. See, we're not responsible for how the other person handles our feedback. They are. We're only responsible for ourselves and how we present the feedback. Feedback's not about criticism. It's about respect for yourself and others. It's about openly and honestly sharing your thoughts with another person in a way that lets them know that you care about them and their safety. Hey, hey Manuel, Manuel. Look, all right, what you're doing there is not okay, and we need to talk about it. Okay, what? Come on, I gotta get this done. I, when I see you cutting that wood on your thigh, I'm afraid you're gonna cut your leg. How long have I been doing this? I don't have any cuts, I don't I have any damages. I know you know what you're doing, but that's not the right way to cut wood. Is that so? Yeah, and you know it is. Remember, we're responsible for giving feedback, for speaking up, 
but how the other person reacts to it is up to them. And just as we shouldn't try and predict how they're going to react, we shouldn't jump to conclusions about why they're working unsafely, because we don't know why. At least, not until we ask them. Hey, you got a second. I gotta get going. Why aren't you using the stairs? What, are you serious? I've been climbing in and out of excavations my entire career. Okay, but seriously, how much effort does it take? Come on, John. You know there's no real danger here. It takes too much time to use the stairs. You're kidding, right? You're gonna get hurt. Use the stairs. It's the right thing to do. Rick, you're one of the best. If you get hurt, who's gonna teach the crew? <sighs> All right, I get it. Once you've found out why somebody's doing something in an unsafe way, work together. See if you can come up with a better way, a safer way of doing it. And the next step is to try to get them to commit to doing it that way. It's like a pig pen. Someone's gonna get hurt just trying to walk through here. Any idea how I got this bad? I'm kind of busy right now. Busy? How busy will you be if somebody breaks a leg and we have to get an ambulance? Okay, I hear you. Just, we're just packing up. How about after lunch? So, in an hour, how many people do you think are going to be walking through here? Waiting is not okay. Okay! Let me find a couple of guys to get this moved for you. Great! I just don't want to see any of my crew tripping and falling. So work together and try to come to an agreement. And if someone won't make a commitment to working safely, then let that person know in a polite way that you're not ready to give up on it and then bump the issue up to your supervisor. When you see an unsafe situation, you cannot walk away. Deal with it before someone gets hurt. And on the other side of the coin, if you see someone working safely, give them positive feedback. Thanks for using the stairs. No problem, you were right. Better to be safe. Positive feedback is an incredibly powerful tool for getting the right thing done. And believe me, it works. A lot to remember? Not really. Whenever you need to speak up, follow three simple steps. Ask, get a commitment, and follow up. Ask, if you see someone working in a way that's not safe, ask them if you can talk about it. Ask them to tell you why they were doing it that way. Explain that you don't want to see them taking risks and that you care about their safety. But don't jump to conclusions. Get a commitment. Work together to come up with a safer way of doing it. And ask them if they'll commit to start doing it that way. This can be one of the tough parts, but if you explain that it's just because you care, they will most likely appreciate your concern and make the commitment. Follow up. Check to see if the other person is working safely. If they're not, remind them of your earlier conversation. If you have to, go through the resolution process again. Catch them doing it right. And if they are working safely, give them positive feedback. Because positive feedback works best over the long haul. Hey, who doesn't like being told that they did a good job? An old fashioned pat on the back and a job well done goes a long way. But don't get me wrong, giving feedback isn't about running all over the place, checking up on everyone, and getting in people's faces. It's about being responsible. It's about being respectful of the other person of yourself, of what you believe. It's about having the guts to speak up when you see someone else doing something that you just know isn't safe. <laughs> okay, I, I know I can get worked up when I talk about this stuff, but I wanna tell you a true story. And it happened at a site very similar to this. It wasn't that long ago. I was working with Jimmy up top. Now Jimmy was the best. He could fly around up there like nobody's business. I was amazed at how good he was and how much work he got done in a day. He knew what he was doing. He got the job done. Until the day when he reached too far and the iron was slippery. I rode with him in the ambulance to the hospital. Jimmy lived, but he never walked again. And the impact of that was life-changing. For him, his wife, children, and co-workers. But you know what the hardest thing is? I could have said something. I mean, I knew it wasn't safe to work the iron without being tied off. I knew better. And I've tried making excuses. I was new, 
He was the experienced guy, that sort of thing. Maybe he would have gotten mad at me and ripped my head off for telling me how to do his job. Maybe. But maybe if I had spoken up, he could still use his legs. You know what? Excuses just don't work. I had a choice. So do you. Growing up, my dad was always coming down on me, correcting me for the stuff I did. He said it was because he loved me and he was trying to keep me from getting hurt, but it doesn't mean I liked it. Around here, they call it feedback. And it, I can take care of myself. I don't need anybody getting in my face. I just let it roll off my back. If somebody gets on me about something, I just say, sure, I'll be more careful next time. But I just say that in order to get rid of them. You know, there are so many rules around here that sometimes you gotta take shortcuts. Save time. People should stay out of other people's business. Where I come from, someone gets in your face, you push back. I don't back down. It's who I am. And I gotta have all of this moved over there yesterday. Hey, Paul, you overloaded. Let's face it, none of us likes to feel that we're being criticized. But suppose you take a risk at work. You do something that could get you or somebody else hurt. Well, why do you take this risk? Maybe you're in a hurry. Or maybe you don't even realize that what you're doing is dangerous. But someone else sees you doing it, and they call you on it. It's called feedback. And around here, it's how we watch out for one another. It's part of our culture. It means that everyone has both the right and the responsibility to speak up and warn someone if we see them doing something we know just isn't safe. But what if you're the one getting the feedback? How should you take it and what should you do about it? Looking to dump that load? Well, how we respond to feedback, whether it's constructive or not, depends on who we are. And in case you haven't noticed, we're all a little bit different. But here's the important thing. It's normal to feel that we're being criticized when someone corrects our behavior. Let's face it, sometimes feedback can sound and feel like criticism. But think about it. If someone is willing to step up and point out that you're doing something that just isn't safe or there's a safer way of doing it, what it really means is they care enough about you and about safety to speak up. Josh! Hey, Josh! Hey, what? It's not locked and tagged out. And you didn't pull the master key. I don't want to see you taking that kind of risk. It bothers me, man. Well, if it bothers you, then don't watch, OK? H how about this? How about you go do your job, and you let me do mine? I don't need the lockout, tag out police telling me how to do my job, OK? Look, I've seen guys get hurt real bad doing that. And I don't want to see anything bad happen to you. Come on, Josh. Remember, it's perfectly normal to feel that we're being criticized when someone gives us feedback. But then, we need to work past those feelings so we can begin to take responsibility for our actions. Because the fact is, the other person is only responsible for giving us the feedback. We're responsible for how we feel about it and how we respond to it. No one else has any control over that. No matter how the other person approaches you or how they say it, if it's about safety, you need to listen. Hey, Carl! You thinking about not using this face shield? It's a simple fix. and They need it ASAP, and I, I, I can't see through that piece of crap. But it's not safe. Look, it's no big deal. What are you busting my chops for? We provide these face shields for a reason. So I'll ask, what could happen? Oh, I could get some crap in my face. What's the worst that could happen? 
If the wheel exploded, I guess it could mess me up. God, I hate it when you're right. As you listen to feedback, make sure you have an understanding of exactly what you were doing that wasn't safe and of what the risks were. Focus on the message, not the messenger. Then try to agree on a safer way to do the job. Make a commitment on the spot to start doing it that way. You're overloading. What are you calling me out for? Look, Paul, we need to talk. Talk? I gotta move this monster. I know, but let's do it safely. Dude, how dangerous can it be, okay? Just let me get it done. Come on, man. You could lose the load. So get off my back. Don't you have your own crew to supervise? You know I have an obligation to speak up. Just divide the load and take more trips. That takes so much time. Less time than recovering in the hospital or having to stop and pick it up. You're right. I don't know what I'm thinking. I don't, I don't want to do this twice. So agree on the spot to start working safely and then do it. Why? Because feedback about safety isn't like any other kind of feedback we get. Suppose someone tells you that your hair is too long or they don't like the way you chew your food. Well, that's feedback too. But you know what? You can take it or leave it. But when it's about safety, if someone cares enough to speak up and warn you that something you're doing isn't safe, then you better listen up. You know what I do? Whenever I'm in a situation where someone gives me feedback, I try to remember two simple steps. Listen and commit. Listen, focus on the message. Get at the facts. Ask questions if needed. Listen, if someone, anyone, gives you feedback about safety, hear them out. Focus on the message. Then you can work past your feelings and get at the facts. And as you listen to the facts, Ask questions if you're not clear. Make sure there's no misunderstanding. Agree on a safer way. Make a commitment, follow it up. Commit. Agree on a safer way to do the job. Make a commitment on the spot to start doing it that way. Then finally follow it up with action. Do what you've agreed to do. Like I said, around here, giving and receiving feedback is the way we watch out for one another. We believe in it. It's part of the job. But it wasn't always that way. We had to learn. I did anyway. It'll be two years ago next month. It was a busy afternoon near quitting time. I wanted to get the job done before the end of shift. Funny, I'd always been the one giving the feedback. This time, I got the feedback. Sure enough, when Frank lost sight of me, he came to check and found me behind the rig. He definitely had something to say. The point is, Frank cared enough about me to stop what he was doing and come check where I was. Other guys, well, they'd been crushed doing what I did. Now, whenever anybody gives me feedback about safety, believe me, I listen up. job locking and tagging out. Thanks. You were right. How's this for you? Thanks for keeping it balanced and low. you decided to use the face shield. Thanks for getting me one that I can see through. Before working on the project, the following need to be in place. We have proof of any required training records and certifications such as operator or competent person paperwork. You have proper work clothing. You have the required personal protective equipment. 
You reviewed your company's job hazard analysis. You have been issued an orientation sticker for your hard hat or a similar ID such as a badge, and you have reviewed and signed off on your task, THA.